Well, first of all, thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, it was a bit of a surprise. I uh, haven't floated for, it's either 39 or 40 years. So, uh, um, and I miss it actually. So um, it, it was an interesting invite. This talk is a rerun. Uh, we have to roll the clock back to the 1970s. This is the state hospital in North Dakota. That entire entity, including the farm you see behind it, is the state hospital. The slaughterhouse, the power plant, all the buildings, that entire thing is the state hospital. They had about 2,000 patients back then. The state hospital actually predates the state. And this, uh, th this actually is a photo off of the asylum project, which tracked insane asylums throughout the United States and the history of that. But when we went to work there in the 70s, it very much resembled the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. In fact, for those of you who remember the movie, these could have been pulled off of the movie, except the color on the right-hand side kind of gives it away as a, a little bit of a modern picture. The three beds in this small room were in fact very common. Overcrowding was the nature of the institution. And it was um, really an awful place. It's not like they didn't do therapy. And for any of you who are a little bit squeamish, I'd like close your eyes for a moment. Um, the upper left is electroshock. The lower left is uh, lobotomy. The upper right is hydrotherapy. And hydrotherapy actually was a, a, a lucky thing for us because when they renovated the wing of the building for our lab, we got the old hydrotherapy area, which no longer was being done after uh, psychiatric medications came around. They cut down on the use of some of the older, more, well, they were kind of insane therapies, actually. Um, Hydrotherapy, they would take um, boiling water in, a, in a, a, a tub and stick a big um, a, a felt pad in it and squeeze all the water out and then lie it along the spine of the individual. And they would basically become, have a heat stroke, essentially. So if you're manic, they would do that to you. If you were underactivated, they would shoot you with hot and cold water jets. I mean, it was really an awful circumstance. And then obviously the lower right is the uh, a, a cell, and quite, quite often people were housed in the cell during the day. 1970s changed the hospital rather dramatically. Um, first of all, the courts ruled that unless you're really a danger to yourself or others, you couldn't be forced to stay in a hospital. And that essentially let a whole bunch of people out. You have to remember there were wards full of people that all that was wrong was them as Parkinsonism, but there was an entire ward full of them. Um, and they weren't a danger to themselves or others, they just needed care. So, and drugs for behavioral management had come about. Uh, they discharged the bulk of the people in the state hospital system during the 1970s. The population in California was uh, dropped um, by a factor of two, uh, basically by opening the doors and kicking people out. North Dakota got an, a gold award. They were the cream of the crud. They, this was the best bad system that you could imagine. They actually did set up systems to receive people in the local communities. So as this was happening, they hired lots of people from the local universities in North Dakota that were teaching at that time the relatively newer approach of humanistic psychology. And we uh, had some of the professors actually go to work at the state hospital and recruited students to come through for internships and as employees. And because of that, um, it, it was kind of an interesting environment. This was before they had IRBs and when they hired us, they basically gave us free access to any patient in the state hospital to do whatever pretty much we wanted to with 
the uh, uh, applied psychophysiology techniques uh, that we were using. So we uh, wrote a grant and had a state hospital laboratory built for us in 1972. And that laboratory was um, a wing, it was a hydrotherapy wing, so it had lots of hot and cold running water and um, lots of space because it wasn't being used anymore. And this was a T at the end of a building, eight rooms on either side of the T. And uh, we basically made a big door to close the whole area off, and that became our lab. And one wing, as you walked in to the right, uh, the last room was custom built, eight foot by eight foot in an eight by 12 room, a tank. And um, it didn't look anything like these wonderful tanks you have here. Uh, th th this, this was very crude and quite ugly, but it worked. Um, essentially, um, we, we had this 8x8 eight by, eight by eight, uh, tank with a, a little bit of uh, filtration and, and uh, uh, sanitation hardware in the entry area. But we, we had built it because um, my lab partner uh, was, had heard of it and we thought it might be interesting to record physiological signals inside of it. And this obviously poses the problem of recording electrical signals inside of a saline environment, which is next to impossible. The, the difficulty of recording the EEG inside the tank was uh, one of the, the big difficulties. Now, at the time, we would do biofeedback training. Um, biofeedback therapy was good for muscle relaxation. It was good for temperature training for migraine. Uh, brainwave alpha training was pretty much the only kind of brainwave training that was being done in the early 1970s. And at that point, um, we actually applied the EEG alpha training to alcoholics um, and had a grant for alpha training in alcoholics, which was turned by, down by NIH in 1974. Uh, but they had quit funding any neurofeedback research in the U.S. at that point. So it was no real big surprise that we didn't get funded. We also were playing around with restricted sensory input, uh, Gantz felt glasses and headphones in a reclining chair, kind of like you've seen in the hallway out here. Um, and for that, we basically were using that for people that had uh, high levels of uh, anxiety and, and tension uh, that could tolerate it, because not everybody that was anxious could tolerate the lack of input. Some people uh, didn't tolerate it uh, really quite badly. Now, we happened to be working at the time with a, a group of humanistic psychology folks, and one of them had um, gone out to the East Coast and learned a new technique called transactional analysis, or TA. And TA was the I'm okay, you're okay uh, 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 psychology, and I'm not a therapist, I'm a brain geek, so I didn't do any of the therapy end of this, I just set up the tanks and techniques and all of this. So um, I'm not into transactional analysis. In fact, my lab partner uh, and I found that the therapist was actually extremely narcissistic and we had to do a little bit of a setup and try it on one of us first and the audio recording, we, we did a tape loop to try and program in the taped message to replace a bad message someone would have in their head from early in their life. And my lab partner and I decided we had to give this a try and we tried it on me. Unfortunately, we used his voice on the tape, which we didn't know. If you get a tape played to you in the sensory deprivation environment, you're going to hear that voice. And so I had my lab partner's voice rattling around my head for a little over a week um, after a one-hour session. And um, so we realized, well, it has to be the patient's voice. And not only that, you have to adjust the frequencies because you don't hear yourself like we do. You hear yourself through bone conduction, so you have a lot more bass. So we had to change the equalization to make it sound like you. Um, so the therapist would work with the people for months and come up with the script that was bad and they would come up with a rescript that they wanted to replace it with. 
And at that point, we did one session with Gonsfeld glasses to see whether they would tolerate the lack of input. Because some people didn't tolerate that. The ones who could, we ended up with five patients within the one year. And in, that was the last year we operated the lab. And during that time, uh, these patients experienced only five sessions during one week. And essentially, when you get into the sensory deprivation environment, your lack of input allows your brain to slow. And what we observed is uh, essentially that the general dominant, eye, what you would normally see as eyes closed EEG, but in a tank, you don't have input, so you end up with the eyes closed EEG pattern even with your eyes open. And uh, th it takes a little bit of time for that to happen, but essentially you have an eyes open alpha state. Now, as you're in the tank for a bit of time, the EEG slows and you become theta dominant, which is the state that you're in in the hypnagogic state as you're falling asleep or as you're waking up the colorful dreams that you might have. And um, essentially that theta state was what we were shooting for. If you think about it, if you have a bad message that was put into you when you were very young, it was put into you during a state that you're not in now as an adult. State-dependent learning. You were in a slow theta state at the time. Until you achieve that same state, you're not going to be able to overwrite the message. So we were putting people in the tank, recording their EEG. Now, the EEG was recorded at the back of the head. Um, uh, we glued the electrode on with collodion. Those of you who don't know what collodion is, it's essentially a protein dissolved in ether. And you squirt it on and it glues on really solidly. If you grabbed the wire and pulled really hard, you'd have some tissue on the end. It wouldn't come off. Now, if you move the wire, it changes the recording. So we not only glued on the electrode, but we would glue the wire on next to it so that if you reached the end of the, of the wire, it wouldn't tug and wiggle the, the electrode, it would simply tug on the wire where it was attached to your scalp. So once the electrode was glued on, by the way, two electrodes for any one electrode that you expected to record from, because electrodes go bad and you don't want to take somebody out of the tank to fix an electrode to put them back in. So two electrodes go on for any one that you want to record. If it goes bad, you simply switch the input to the amp. And as the person sits there and relaxes, their uh, initial experience is that there's an underwater speaker playing pink noise. And white noise is harsh, you know. Pink noise is kind of a softer sound. And essentially that noise kind of fades away. If you hear that staticky noise long enough, you just don't pay attention to it anymore. And as your brain waves change to a slower pattern, the EEG being picked up essentially at that point switched the, uh, these were analog filters and Schmidt triggers, but uh, old analog uh, technology, everything's nice and digital now. But uh, uh, essentially the tape would kick in, the pink noise would fade out, the, your voice would fade in, and the I'm okay message would come on. Now, um, that I'm okay message was tailored to the individual. And I, again, I'm not the therapist. And I, I, after 40 years, I don't remember specifically what any one of those messages was. But the messages would essentially play in the background. If you focused on it, if you paid attention to it, your brain waves would speed up, the message would turn off. and you'd, If you focused on it, all you got was pink noise. As soon as you quit focusing on it, in went the tape message again. So this was an involuntary reprogramming, which is why back then, when we finished with the five patients during that one year, we didn't present any of this data. Most of you are from, I've been around for the last day, most of you are too young to remember the early 70s, but the politics then was not that friendly, and we didn't think that this brainwashing technique was good to hand out to the US government at the time. So we didn't present any of our outcomes. Um, uh, 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 now they do stuff that makes this look 
like child's play. And quite honestly, it was. We were kids, you know, just playing. Um, but essentially, the big trick was to seal off the electrode from any of the water, and that was done with petroleum jelly, um, which now we can take out a lot better. Back then, we didn't have the Dawn dishwashing detergent, which they use on geese and ducks that get in the grease and stuff. Well, it works really well uh, to take grease off, and we didn't have it back then. So. Um, at the time, I had a long ponytail I could sit on, and um, it was pretty slick back at a ponytail because the grease was in it. It was hard to get out. And I had spent hundreds of hours in the tank back then. It was, it was a really fun time. My, my, my first experience, before any of this hookup for the experiment happened, my first time sitting in the tank, you know, my, my partner was the one who knew about tanks at all, and he had told me that this was going to be a fabulous, trippy experience, and, you know, this is the 1970s, altered consciousness was a, a thing people aspired towards, and I thought, well, you know, why not? Let's give it a try, and I got in the tank, and I'm sitting there, laying, and, well, it's supposed to be some trippy thing. Oh, this is a dark place that's wet, and I'm an old swimmer, so the wet wasn't anything new, and I... I'm starting to get bored, and I thought, well, gee, this isn't anything like it was cracked up to be, and then I started to see little bits of light, and then I felt like there's a pressure underneath me, and I started to spin around and around, flying towards the light. Now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> this is more like what they were talking about. So, I, you know, it was a really fun initial experience, and the ones after that were equally interesting not just sensorily, but with respect to internal journeys, knowing yourself. I mean, there's nobody else there in the tank. Who else are you going to know? So uh, we, we basically enjoyed uh, playing around in the tank for the few years we were there. The lab ran from 72 to 75, and the last year was when we were doing this experiment. But we had the tank constructed after our first six months of operation. And we didn't really know what we were doing. There weren't a lot of people around like you all. And there weren't instruction books on how to do this. And so uh, by trial and error, uh, we, we ended up throwing all this together. And um, at this point, it could be done so much better than we did it. I mean, goodness, you can see the quality of the, the tanks is phenomenal. Um, the quality of the chemistry in the tanks is phenomenal, as we heard a little earlier. And believe me, this tank, you could smell the chlorine like a bad swimming pool when you walked into the, into the lab. So um, the, uh, it, it's nice to have modern technology. And, and if this were to be done again, the updated version of this would be a, a total rewrite of what we had been doing. Again, the technology that we used was ancient by comparison. The amplifiers were all made by us because you couldn't purchase good EEG amplifiers at the time. Um, so th this was essentially a homemade tank with homemade amplifiers. The analysis that we were doing was on mainframe computers. Um, all of the data ended up going to the mainframe computer, but the triggering and Filtering and everything was done right there. We tracked um, uh, the EEG spectrum uh, using the IBM mainframe in Fargo, North Dakota, 100 miles away from the state hospital. Um, by the way, is anybody here from North Dakota? I, know, I don't see anybody here from North Dakota. But that's the way it goes. Uh, very few folks there, you know. Um, if this were to be redone, um, the, the big trick, again, was simply to get the dry contact for the electrode to keep it from shorting through the salt water. And uh, um, from what I hear, there's a 10-channel wireless system that may be dry now, which uh, it, it, it sounds like the good old times weren't the good old times. Uh, they were the bad old times by comparison. So especially if you flip back to those therapies that were done previously. I mean, we were a little leery of what we were doing with the patients, but when you compare that to what had been done to patients for so long, you know, it's, you can see why there was really no IRB 
at that moment. Now, since then, obviously, people have seen the, the wisdom of regulating crazy researchers. Um, and what we did then probably couldn't have been done under an IRB now very easily. Um, you're talking about reprogramming somebody's pre-conscious, subconscious material with a technique. And you, know, you might not get a whole bunch of people lining up to approve that. So um, I, if somebody wishes to try to move this forward in current times, I'd be happy to offer our experience as a pilot, but um, good luck. Uh, IRBs uh, are there to protect the patient, and they need lots of protection uh, uh, from the old days, uh, luckily. Um, the typical experience of a transactional analysis therapist is that you can talk to your client about the change, and you they, they can get a, they know what the message should be, but it's really hard to get back down into those deep states to change it. In the five sessions, these people reported a total change in their life. And there was a slide earlier as, as floating ch changed somebody's life. And, you know, these people had dramatic life changes. The, the messages that they had before were totally supplanted. They had their own message in there now, not some bad message that had been put there. And it took five sessions within one week to do it. The transactional analysis therapists were working six months to a year to get anything even close to that. And it never really took with some of the people. These five people had a total change in their unconscious view of themselves by having the programming put in. And um, let me share a brief anecdote about the, my pilot experience. The therapist who was a transactional analysis therapist who was referring the people to us, um, my lab partner and I knew him really well. And this is a very um, narcissistic person. He's so full of himself. And when my lab partner put me into the tank to do the experiment to see whether the the filters and trigger, Schmidt triggers would change and whether this would be too much of a change or I'd orient to it or any of that. We put in a tape in my lab partner's voice and uh, um, as more of a joke. Um, and we were just testing to see if the, the sound worked and, and all of that. So it was like somebody saying, check, check, check. But um, we wanted it to be a bit of a message. My lab partner thought, well, I'm okay, you're okay, is the whole transactional analysis thing. And given his opinion of the therapist, he put the message, I'm okay, I'm okay, it's all about me. And that's what I heard for over a week, you know, in his voice. So um, it, it literally puts it in in a way that you can't stop it. You can't stop it. If you've, it, it, you'd have to sit up and, and stay focused so you didn't have any slow brain activity for it to have as a target. That's the only way to have avoided it. So it's totally an involuntary change. Now, they, you know, they were voluntarily entering into the tank. Their therapist had worked with them for a long period of time to come up with a message that they needed and everything. So this wasn't just grabbing somebody off the street and doing some brainwashing to put a message in. But again, we figured that that could be what somebody did with the technique. So we just, when we shut the lab down, we shut it down and we didn't present this data anywhere to anybody. And actually when I was called to talk about this here, I was a bit surprised. Um, you know, it's never been published, it's hardly ever been talked about, but uh, uh, Bryant uh, is here uh, somewhere, I can't really see very well, and he, he had heard stories from years and years of hanging out in the lab, and um, uh, he had kind of heard about this. So uh, last year he uh, shared the anecdote, and that's why I got invited. No, I'm fine with sharing it now. Uh, in the 1970s, we didn't publish it, we didn't present it, we didn't talk about it outside of the immediate people we were working with, because we thought that this was a dangerous technique. 
Um, and I, I'd be happy, if, again, if somebody wants to do this kind of a thing and they need to talk about this with a regulatory body or something, this is the pilot study. So I'd be happy to talk about it or write it up if somebody needs it for something. But other than that, it's just an old story from the early 70s. And I, it, it's an old story at this point. Um, the, the tank is gone. Uh, the lab is gone. When, in 1975, I moved to California to start manufacturing biofeedback devices, and uh, I got out of that business fairly quickly. You, you know how to make a small fortune in biofeedback? Start with a big one. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, l luckily the float uh, business works very, very well. Manufacturing for a niche market, as soon as you sell into the niche and you saturate the market, your sales are gone. So, you know, it, um, I, I quickly went into the service industry instead of the sales, and that worked very nicely. I've been doing EEG services for ever. <laughs> uh, uh, I was the first tech in the world to be certified in computer analysis of the brain's electrical patterns. So if anybody wants to get a hold of me for um, uh, purposes of sharing this for a, a, a uh, regulatory hurdle reason or something, uh, feel free to get a hold of me. Um, other than that, um, uh, this probably, un unless it's to help somebody out, I, I probably am not going to spend the time to write this up. Most of the time at this point I'm doing uh, uh, high-level brain analysis to predict medication uh, success and failure in psychiatry, and um, I I have quite a bit of writing about the genetic basis of the EEG, the uh, endophenotypes uh, identified in the EEG. So I, I, I'm tied up with uh, a lot of other stuff, but if it would, it would benefit somebody that's trying to get this kind of a thing done again, I'd be happy to help out, but I don't have any particular need to write this up myself unless it would help somebody. <laughs>